Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Siddhi Manning New from 4MCOM, Christ Deemed to be University. And this is Anjali Singh from 2MCOM, Christ Deemed to be University. And we welcome you for all some Shodhan speaker series. Today, we are privileged to have Dr. Manjana Menon, a distinguished faculty member at Azim Premji University, Bengaluru. With a strong academic background in agricultural economics, she brings extensive experience in ecological and behavioral economics. Before academia, she spent nearly two decades as a principal scientist at the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, focusing on rural livelihoods, climate change adaptation, and sustainable agriculture. Dr. Manjula is dedicated to education, teaching subjects like ecology, economics, sustainable agriculture, and research for social action to MA, de MA development students and development se sector practitioners. A passionate advocate for gender equality, she explores the political economy of gendered access to resources, leading impactful initiatives empowering rural women in agriculture. Beyond teaching, Dr. Manjula's leadership is evident in numerous journal papers, book chapters, and research reports. She coordinates research projects supported by multilateral organizations, government agencies, and donor agencies. Her mantra emphasizes that empowering women in agriculture isn't just about gender equality, but unlocking the full potential of agricultural system for a resilient and prosperous future. Thank you, ma'am, for accepting our invitation. We're glad to have you on board. And welcome to some Shodhan speaker series. We will have a presentation from ma'am, followed by an interview. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, very kind and elaborate uh, introduction. So I have a, a you know PowerPoint to share and uh, sure, yeah yeah. Is this visible? Yes. Yes. Ma yes. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you for having me um, and. Uh, uh, today, I'll be talking about um, a work that I did when I was part of uh, the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, where I was uh, playing a lead role uh, in building a social enterprise. Am I audible? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Building a social enterprise, especially with, uh, you know, women diary farmers. So here, uh, it, as it is titled, it is, uh, I'll be talking about how we used science and technology to bring about the social change, and I'll be bringing in, uh, you know, empirical evidence from uh, micro-level interventions in sustainable agriculture. And, uh, uh, you know, basically this is about leveraging science and technology for gender transformative changes. And the case study is on the women diary farmers, which we had initiated and set up in uh, one of the districts in Tamil Nadu, the details of which uh, I'll run you through the presentation. Stop me if you have any questions in between or uh, uh, how is the pattern like? Do I finish the presentation and then we... Yeah, I'll ask you questions to the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the background is, you know, as all of you know, like gender equality poses a great challenge in building a resilient, inclusive and sustainable food system. And it weakens most of the interventions in achieving global targets of zero hunger. We know that the uh, field of agriculture is undergoing transformative changes because of the kind of advancements we see in the science and technology. There is a rapid development of markets. We are such a part of a global uh, you know, system and there is trade happening. There is expansion of markets. There is expansion of value chains. All this is happening and side by side, we also have impacts of climate change and there is also a feminization of agriculture <coughs> with male out migration, both distress related as well as not distress related. So there is an overall feminization of agriculture, which has been studied and proven, <coughs> especially in the South Asian, sorry about that, I'm having a cough, especially in the South Asian economy. So we are looking at this intervention in this context. And many of the transformation positive as well as a negative that is impacting agriculture. Most of us are gender blind, and it has a very gendered consequences. And this in turn reshapes gender relationships and most of the time results in exacerbating the gender inequity that's already part and parcel of the agriculture production system. And this is the fundamental premise for designing such an intervention and implementing such an intervention uh, in, among dairy farmers. And uh, uh, you know, equitable gender relations have, there is enough empirical evidence that has shown that wherever there is equitable gender relations, 
that has led to emergence of efficient and profitable smallholder farming systems. And there has been balanced outcomes observed in terms of household diet and nutrition. So there has also been study which has established that if uh, women have same access to productive resources as men, production on women's farm in developing countries will go up by 20 to 30 percent. And the total agriculture production can go up by almost around 4 percent. And you can reduce world's hungry population by 12 to 17 percent. These are all statistics that I'm belting out from, you know, uh, literatures that are already uh, studies that are already done, literatures that are already available in the public domain. And the re recent UN Food System Summit 2021, which was part of the last COP, the 2021 COP, emphasized or recognized the importance of gender equality and women's empowerment and identified these two pillars as major levers of change to enhance food security. And what did they identify as key direct area, areas for direct intervention? One is the women's right to land, and they spoke about economic empowerment and building leadership in food system. They spoke about access to technologies, accounting for women's role in unpaid care work, which is a major part of women's, uh, you know, time use. Any time use survey on women's uh, on time spent by women uh, per day will show that a large part of the time also gets spent in unpaid care work, which doesn't get accounted for at all and gender responsive agriculture and food system policies. So these were the key areas for identified for direct intervention by the UN Food System Summit in 2021. And what I'm going to elaborate, uh, you know, works around most of these, in, uh, you know, direct intervention pillars that has been identified by the UN Food Systems. And this, as I mentioned earlier, to begin with, is part of a project which I was instrumental in implementing when I was part of the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. So the livelihood context of the site of SNT intervention, this is this was a, a project or a program which was implemented in Kanivadi region of Dindukal district of Tamil Nadu. Uh, it's a semi-arid region uh, located in the Radia Chatram block in the district. And 75% of the total geographic area, area is under cultivation and it includes both dry and irrigated lands. Crop cultivation and livestock rearing are the major livelihood options and October to December, the major seasons, and some of the crops that you can see are maize, cotton, vegetables, and pulses. Though there is a shift, uh, the tendency to shift to long duration crops like coconut, banana, and lemon of late. And uh, uh, the livelihood vulnerability analysis and seasonality map shows that there is a rapid decline in rural job opportunities. And for men, it is about 157 labor days, and for women, it is about 172 labor days. This is a context or the uh, context or the background of the site in which I'm going to speak about the uh, intervention or the program that I was uh, uh, part of, as, uh, which is uh, uh, the Women Diary Farmers Producer Organization. So what is the role of role and position of women in diary value chain and why did we even think of implementing a project like that in this area? Uh, agriculture, as we know, especially the crop-based one, which includes land as a major resource, is a man's domain. Livestock, if you have seen, is largely a women's domain um, because most of the livestock is owned and managed. If not owned, it's absolutely managed by the women. Women are actively engaged in production and marketing in the livestock sector, but it also includes long working hours. It means that there is a long working hour and it increases the drudgery of the women's work uh, because despite being actively engaged in agriculture, which is a crop-based farming system as unpaid family labor contribution, and also being engaged in livestock full-time, they also are not left out of their social reproductive roles, when like cooking, cleaning, taking care of the elderly, the children and all that. So most of 40% of the work of the uh, time that they spend is also on social reproductive work. So some of the challenges will be like, you know, it will sound a bit cliched also for you. It's the usual ones, you know, the lack of uh, access to resources and scientific know-how to realize maximum efficiency in livestock production, low milk productivity in the production phase for exactly the reason that I have mentioned earlier, because they do not have access to scientific know-how of production. And that leads to poor management and low milk productivity uh, in the production phase, gender-based inequalities in access to and control over resources, lack of access to improved science and technologies, low access to veterinary services and other institutional uh, 
support systems available for uh, animal husbandry and very low control over decision making both at the household level as well as in the production and as well as in the productive sphere even though they are managing most of the livestock uh, uh, livestock they do not have so much of decision making uh, power when it comes to major decisions about buying and selling what kind of uh, you know whether they should be taken to the vet doctor or not what kind of feed to give they there is a lot of intervention by the men or uh, or other members of the household so what is the science and technology intervention we were essentially looking at strategies for horizontal and vertical integration across the value chain so there were two components to this intervention one was the science and technology component in production and management and the second part is a complementary institutional processes that was set in place uh, like you know facilitating access to entitlements facilitating access to knowledge and resources and building social capital through collectivization so that their bargaining power or their collective bargaining power is improved and goes up the technological interventions were largely in the field of feed management because that was one major area where there was a, a very limited knowledge on what is the combination of feed to be given for the for the uh, animal to yield uh, to its maximum potential how much of greens and how much of concentrate feed has to get in what kind of greens have to get in so there was no not much information on that with the women uh, animal health was another major uh, constrained area uh, which uh, and this was a major uh, uh, you know this was articulated as a major constraint uh, uh, as part of the cost of production uh, estimates 30% of the production cost was uh, spent on managing animal health post production handling was another major area because uh, they lost out on prices of milk uh, based on rejections based on poor quality and on snf you know uh, uh, the the content uh, measures so quality based pricing they were not included as part of the quality they lost out on quality based pricing and hygiene uh, hygienic management of uh, uh, milk after handling institutional interventions these were the technology technology part of it which is the hardware part of it but we also had put in a system of softwares which is the institutional intervention so to say one is this working on marketing mostly working on aggregation and dealership building those dealership with the women farmers strengthening social capital as i said to build the collective power getting them into groups federating the whole uh, uh, groups into producer or companies producer organizations and registering them as producer company facilitating institutional linkages largely through convergence we were like you know linking them to the animal husbandry department the veterinary clinics Uh, the other input centers, the universities, uh, animal husbandry university for good quality seeds for the fodder plots, and also connecting them to the KVKs and all these agencies as well as the panchayats, and facilitating enabling business environment like even bringing these private agencies, the milk collectors, uh, the private milk players, uh, so to say, in the region, and linking them, the women producer collectors, linking these uh, collectors to these private agencies. was another part of the institutional intervention so this whole package had a hardware component and a software component and approaches as usual was sensitization capacity building convergence synergy uh, and uh, you know institutional uh, you know collectivization and building of this federation so, and this project was supported by the ministry of women and child development government of india so these are some of the catalytic technologies introduced uh, i'm not going to read out everything you can see that uh, Uh, you know as i said feed was a major issue so we were also promoting this model uh, fodder plots and the women were uh, trained on how to uh, lay out this model uh, uh, you know fodder plots which is a very small one cent area uh, kind of a plot which didn't take up take away a lot of the cultivation area so the men and the other members of the household were not objecting to it so they were allowed to do this azolla cultivation was another major input low cost and decentralized production was introduced green fodder chaff cutter because you know chaff cutting you know the uh, collection of green fodder was a major time consuming operation and introducing this chaff cutter you know helped the processing of the feed uh, quickly <coughs> an interesting thing that we did in animal health was because uh, uh, access to animal health service was a major challenge and they had to walk the cattle literally from the villages to the district headquarters it was around 5 kilometers 10 kilometers or even 30 kilometers for some of those farmers to walk the cattle literally the sick cattle up to the veterinary clinics which were there in the or the hospitals which were there in the district headquarters and walk them back it was such a strenuous uh, exercise to do so what we tried doing is to create a set of paraveterinary support services 
like uh, you know um, identifying young women from these uh, uh, villages and training them on disease management and linking them with the doctors with the app and the phones and the smartphones and things like that and they were trained by the veterinary doctors and they were given a certification and they could give the first aid and they were uh, you know uh, authorized to give first aids and other uh, artificial in insemination and other kinds of basic uh, vet support services which was a huge relief for the uh, you know large uh, large number of smallholder uh, dairy producers and another was a direct linkage with the veterinary department wherein we used to set up this health camps vaccination drives was happening and the doctors used to come and do this vaccination uh, you know the foot and mouth uh, vaccination and all that so uh, feed was one component animal health and post production handling a major uh, challenge in that area was the women uh, were never uh, uh, engaging in milking of their own cows they were always dependent on the uh, the person who comes to collect the milk on behalf of the private agency for milking the cows and this person used to kind of cheat them on the uh, not just on the quality also on the quantity and uh, more often than not they were also like middlemen who doubles as money lenders so what happens was like you know there was some small payment which was to be done for this milking the uh, service that they were offering and they also used to lend money during distress and uh, uh, and they were getting cheated on both uh, uh, the uh, the loan that was being given as well as the quantity and the quality because they were not able to and they were not able to dealing themselves from this middleman because these women were not cap uh, were not trained in milking and there was a mental there was some kind of a, a you know a, a mental block so to say to engage with milking it took a lot of sensitization and conversation with these women to understand the relevance of you know getting trained on uh, milking and how it will help uh, uh, to dealing themselves from the middlemen and uh, we were successful in doing that and the women uh, all the women were trained on uh, milking and uh, gradually over a period of 6 months we were able to dealing them completely away from the middlemen we, we could wean out the middlemen from them we also for those who were not uh, comfortable with doing their milk uh, do the, doing the milking we introduced milking machines uh, to help them uh, uh was anybody saying something no no okay so so also we also established women operated and milk uh, managed milk collection centers this was also to do or wean them away from the traders so the private agencies the private uh, uh, milk collection uh, big players like the shakti and the other big players in the area they had their own traders who would collect come and collect the milk in bulk from the villages so we uh, engaged in a conversation with its big private players and asked them to establish milk collection centers which were operated and manned by the women uh, who are part of this collective so, so they agreed to it and uh, the, some of the state of the art milk collection centers were established in the villages and it was a complete delinking and weaning away from the middlemen as well as the traders who were engaged and that did see a lot of dividend in terms of uh, uh, you know the kind of uh, money that they could uh, profit that they could make from uh, this venture so what are some of the key outcomes uh, one was definitely a uh, building of women's leadership uh, you know creating a cadre of para veterinarians about 40 of them were trained on this uh and they were like you know they were equipped with kits to diagnose and support implementation of technical advice from the veterinary doctor so you had this uh, uh, young woman who would you know go around with this veterinary kit and feeling very proud about it and doing the service for their own uh, kith and kin and the village uh, people and they were getting a small uh, service charge for that and they were all they were living within this village not having to go out of the village finding a job as well and also trying to do some kind of a social service because it was a very nominal service charge that they were getting paid and for the dairy farmers especially the women dairy farmers uh, this entailed some 40% reduction in the treatment cost technology uptake was uh, you know the the this, uh, the members of the dairy collective uh, they were self sufficient in green forage because we had introduced this model uh, farms model fodder plots and they were also trained on uh, producing this concentrate feed and uh, there was you know the concentrate feed was also available at the doorstep and there was this group who was doing this so there was a uh, balanced nutrition and producing uh, which reduced the feed cost by around 40% so market infrastructure and linkage i have spoken enough about it already there were around 12 milk collection centers that were established the last one i know uh, it has gone up uh, it would have gone up uh, uh, 
to a much higher number uh, the last couple of years. And uh, 4,500 liters per day were being transacted across uh, uh, each of the centers. Uh, 4,000 uh, per month worth of uh, you know, uh, turnover. Institutional linkages, there was a lot of convergence and synergy and institutional linkages being done. We were linking them with the banks for credit access, technology, uh, for technology, they were linked with the Department of Animal Husbandry for uh, uh, quality fodder seeds and seedlings. They were linked with the Animal Husband, uh, you know, Animal Husbandry University. Uh, collectives and social capital, around 1,150 women dairy producers uh, became shareholders in the Kulume Milk Producer Company Limited. That's what they are called. Uh, the producer company is called, it's called the Kulume Milk Producer Company Limited. And, and they were all with the improved bargaining power and input and complete end-to-end -end, uh, you know, value chain linkages. So convergence, synergy, and then end-to-end uh, hand-holding for the uh, women diary farmers. So the changes in the gender relations and roles, these were some of the indicators across which we had captured uh, the impact of the, the gendered impact of the gender transformative impact, so to say, of the project that we have implemented uh, the social uh, uh, in creating the social enterprise. Uh, the role change, attitudes, personal empowerment, and others. This was some of the indicators on which we had captured uh, uh, impact. And this is a conceptual framework that we had used. I'm not going to get into the details of that. I'll just run you through what we saw as terms of uh, results. Uh, so for responsibility, we saw that uh, after the project intervention, responsibility for the women uh, had gone up, uh, especially the uh, animal husbandry, uh, livestock related uh, production systems. Uh, uh, but uh, this responsibility has gone up without disturbing the existing power structures within the livestock firms. Because the women were careful not to, uh, you know, disturb or topple the apple cart. And they were not challenging uh, uh, the stereotypical uh, gender norms that were established. They were taking it a bit slow. They were taking on the additional responsibility, happily saying that we will do it, but we don't are not expecting the men to contribute to it. So it turned out to be less executable for women in terms of work burden and responsibility sharing. Uh, public participation, we found that women had much more opportunities and engagement in public participation after the project. Although it is increasing, again, it was not with the women did not challenge norms. It was always, always women were trying to negotiate, confirm, and then through negotiations, they were trying to get that space for themselves without outright challenging. So, uh, which we, on hindsight, we think was a good strategy also, because if they were challenging right from the beginning, uh, maybe, you know, they would not have reached where they have reached today. So they were accommodative to begin with. They were trying to negotiate a little going, uh, you know, two steps backward, one step forward kind of an approach uh, with other members of the community, especially the men and the elderly members of the community who were and uh, you know struggling with the uh, social norms that has been very strongly exercised in those regions so decision making we did see a, a change in the decision making women were increasingly involved in decision making either in a consultative role or, or, or there were also instances where women were lead decision makers also like uh, it was somewhat moving towards a more equitable relation at the household level Patriarchal values were not done away with. It still existed at the societal level. Uh, and so uh, women's decision making at major uh, community level was restricted. And, and major decision making at a community or a societal level uh, was not really happening. But at the household level, we could see some differences. Of course, there was a lot of improvement in social recognition for the women. Uh, changes are noticeable, but still social values or gender disparities restrict uh, spaces for public spaces for women. So there is respect, there is recognition, but still, you know, they are still kind of there are there are norms which are very strong enough, deep rooted, which will which is which are all the slow moving institutions, and it will still take a lot of time. But nevertheless, uh, one step uh, at a time, kind of a change, we can see like you know a threshold change happening uh, over a, a long periods of time. So control over assets. Uh, of the new assets that has been created from the money that the women generated or earned through being particip participating in this uh, enterprise, uh, any new asset that they had uh, earned, the women had complete control over it. Uh, whereas in the ancestral property or the traditional uh, property that they owned, the women uh, women did not have so much of control. Uh, men exercised more control over this. Uh, so the assets, as I said, the ancestral property rights are held by women. Uh, due to, 
again going back to the social values and norms so this was not outright handed over to the women for uh, you know operations but new assets were always under the control of the women knowledge and skills there is increase in women's participation in the higher end of the value chain uh, as i said they were part of the uh, there was a cadre of para veterinarians uh, which is not a, a traditional gender role that the women in the community played so they were new set of para veterinarians who were you know substituting or sometimes complete more often and uh, you know complementing the veterinary doctors uh, uh, they were milk collection centers they were operating managing the milk collection center the state of the art milk collection centers and also they operating milking machines and all that which are not not traditional gender roles that the women in the community did but these were gender roles that were uh, uh, that women took over after participating in this intervention so that has been quite uh, uh, you know knowledge the new knowledge that they have acquired the new skills that they have acquired has really helped in bringing about more equitable changes for women or gender transformative changes for women work burden as i mentioned earlier uh, has not been that equitable all the additional work burden that has come to them or that they were part of for being part of this intervention it was not uh, equally shared by the men there was uh, some uh, there was not they were not so forthcoming in sharing these responsibilities though they fully recognized and realized uh, Uh, the benefit that women's participation in these kind of interventions was bringing to the household in terms of this additional income uh, to the household nevertheless it was a, as i said a slow moving uh, change though uh, when women came out to participate in meetings or uh, went to the offices or the banks the men did take over a child uh, you know taking care of children or uh, some of the do- minor domestic chores but it was not substantive Uh, or the way that we would have expected them to share mobility there is an improved and expanded mobility uh, women could travel independently they were participating in more meetings they were traveling to several uh, line departments and official uh, and interacting with officials and marketing agencies private dealers all of these people which was not uh, something which they were doing before so it was it has it has uh, mobility has been uh, highly equitable the change in that has been highly equitable for women conflict and violence there is perceptible change in the attitude of men uh, in terms of domestic violence they don't take it as granted they they, they don't take it as their uh, uh, you know birth right to beat women anymore they are recognized uh, there has been a lot of it's not like something which happened overnight uh, there has been a lot of sensitization around this and also this women being part of collective itself has added to their uh, Uh, it has added some kind of a courage and then that being part of a collective has added some kind of a bargaining position improved their bargaining position at the household level because if there was this one woman if the collective knows that one of their uh, uh, you know uh, sisters were uh, being abused at the household or in some places they would all come as a group and then uh, you know try to reason out with that man or try to have a conversation in the household and try and find out so uh, this was increasingly happening and that kind of a Uh, uh the the group engagement did lead to reduced uh, um, conflict and violence at the household and the community level uh and which is, has been uh, you know quite equitable a little equitable in that sense opportunities that women have been women uh, the opportunities for women has increased tremendously and uh, the kind of institutional engages or the kind of uh, uh, activities that they engage in post participation in the conference i mean the uh, in the intervention uh, has gone up uh, in multiples uh, is unimaginable kind of participation that they get opportunities that they get so this has been quite supportive for women to expand their spaces especially the space of marketing the quality check price control bargaining position improving the bargaining position and uh, other areas access to institutional spaces has been tremendous as i said women have been accessing these institutional spaces especially as after being part of this intervention it has been equitable for women so uh, so as a conclusion i would say this was a social uh, this was an initiative which which falls under the social enterprise basket of the entrepreneurship which is it is a former producer organization which is a women managed women member based farmer producer organization of 1150 members is what i know of 2 years late before now it will have expanded i i heard that the last we heard was like something something around 2500 or close to 3000 members in the kulumai diary uh, corporate uh, producer company so uh, but what was the pathway to completely it was a science and technology 
intervention in the production and management phase, which has had spillover effect in the social reproductive spaces and created irreversible changes in gender roles and relations in the long run in the community. And building this soft component that we had put in along with the hard component of science and technology has helped women to address some of the barriers that deepen the gender inequality in that uh, and improve their social recognition. And it has also helped improve decision making at the household level as well as the uh, livelihood opportunity level as a social uh, at the community level. There has been perceptible reduction in conflict and gender based violence, uh, increased responsibility for women. Yes. Uh, and not so much of sharing from the men. Uh, role change has been noticed, as I said, in the division of labor, para vet, milk collection center. These are things which never, which ne which women never before were engaged in. These are roles that women uh, took over after being part of this intervention. Ownership and control over assets. We I've already mentioned that on the newly acquired ones, women had complete control and ownership of resources. Uh, so this is a science and technology out and out science and technology intervention along with institutional uh, processes which are put in place that has facilitated uh, the creation of a social enterprise for women diary producers, the smallholder diary producers, that has resulted in equitable gender relations uh, or, or addressing the issue of gender inequality and resulted in gender transformative changes which are visible and captured through the indicators that I've uh, spoken in this, uh, spoken in this uh, you know, talk. So I'll stop here and I will take some uh, questions, maybe. Yeah, sure, ma'am, sure. Uh, that that was so inspiring, ma'am. I mean, uh, as much as it's uh, a project, it's more like a life-changing journey. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, uh, just out of curiosity, uh, you told that uh, uh, it's totally a woman-led uh, organization. So all the functional areas across the uh, you know company, everything is managed by women. Yes, yes, everything is managed. It's a women, uh, women's, it's, it, the members are the women, the board of directors are the women, uh, but they will have employees who are men. Okay. okay. So it doesn't mean like, so, so you know the difference between a shareholder and an employee, right? Yes, uh, yes, yes. So you have employees who are men, but all the shareholders are essentially women. And the okay. decision making body, the executive body, the board of directors, all are women. Okay, okay. Uh, Ma'am, is there a plan to uh, expand this project beyond Bindical? I mean, give... uh, it is uh, now. See, Bindical itself is a huge space, you know, and we are in one of those blocks. Mm -hmm. Expanding it across the blocks in Bindical itself is a huge challenge. Uh, but um, I, I would, I would uh, say that this is one of the producer organization that operates in Kaniwadi region as part of the MSSRF intervention, you have a lot of other producer collectors. This is on diary. So it's exclusively on diary. So you have one on exclusively work on uh, working on drumsticks. You have one working on all products of agriculture. You have one on vegetables, uh, I mean, uh, fruits and vegetables alone. So you have a lot of these kind of uh, uh, producer organizations and they all come under a larger umbrella called the Kulumai. Okay. So it is one among these. So you have, uh, yeah, scaling up is a challenge. Uh, uh, you know, one is the resource constraint. We do not have that kind of resources. Mm -hmm. So of course, yes. But if you ask me if it is possible to scale up, definitely yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's the resources that is constraining. Yeah. Okay. And ma'am, how? I mean, uh, how uh, are the children there? I mean, uh, getting the support. I mean from your, uh, this uh, you know, company as such for their education or to break the stereotype, at least in the coming generation, this stereotyping and all that can be. Uh, 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 yeah, if I may answer this, uh, it, it would not be a direct intervention from the company, from the producer company with the stu children. But you know, like, you know, these are women who are part of this. And uh, if you educate a woman, if the woman gets an employment, the one who benefits most is their children. So they invest a lot. The kind of investment that they do with the extra money that they earn or the additional income that they earn by being part of this project gets heavily invested or a large chunk of it gets into children's education and children's nutrition. Uh, and they also see this, uh, you know, they are seeing their mothers uh, or uh, sisters or, you know, or aunties doing this, you know, being active in all this kind of engagements. And, you know, having this negotiating with the men in the community, as well as the private dealers, as well as the input dealers. So they grow grow up seeing all this, this empowered women, you know, doing a lot of things. That itself is inspiration. 
But in terms of uh, uh, investment, each of the household, we have seen that a major chunk of the expenditure that, uh, you know, investment that goes from this additional income is towards children's education and uh, meeting their nutritional requirements. Ma'am, one, one last question related to the... Uh, right. Ma'am, is there a, a visible change of the men's attitude at least now? There, yeah, there is, but but I, I, I will have to admit, like, you know, patriarchy is deep-rooted. So it is very difficult to move, you know, don't imagine that, you know, go just do some intervention and then it's a magic wand and everything changes and women are like this, uh, uh, you know, very empowered. All that is nice. It is all written and told. But in reality... We have seen that at the intra-household level, the community level, there is deep-rooted social norms, which not just the men implement, right? The women also internalize some of this. So they kind of, it is a very natural process for them. So they don't feel like exploited is a, is a terminology that maybe as an outsider you might use. But they might not feel that it is exploitation unless it is like real physical abuse. Otherwise, they accept there's a lot of internalization of many of these uh, norms and restrictions on women. So it requires a lot of patience and working and sensitization. And these are changes. Which, uh, and uh, I I'll tell you the, the kind of interventions we do in, in the social sector is not the, the direct approach is not to challenge existing social norms. That is embedded in the intervention, but that's not the direct approach. The direct approach is to work with them, work on the vulnerabilities, work on the deprivations and pull them out of these deprivations and vulnerabilities. That way you build the trust of the community and they know that they will be, you are there for a good cause. You will be, the, you, you are there to help them. And then the gender transformation or the breaking the uh, uh, norms is a slow process, which has to, which can happen only after you have built that trust. So you can't, you are not, uh, we are not an activist organization. Right, we are an organization which works on strengthening livelihoods and using, especially using science and technology. So that's our approach. That doesn't mean that we shy away from working on that front, but our approach uh, that is not our direct area of intervention is what I'm trying to tell you. Got you. Yeah. Ma'am, as I was very fascinated with the stories of these women, so you said that they had to negotiate and struggle what with social uh, societal norm and all. They came as a group to fight if one of their members had this issue. So can you share some instances or stories, examples of the such uh, women who have embraced this entrepreneurship and everything? Uh, I, I'm not one, not one, not from this site alone. I have worked across the six to seven states in India. I have hundreds of stories. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, yeah, like, you know, when uh, in Vidarbha, I can tell you where this women... Uh, there, you know, in the in the backdrop of the farmer suicides, and there was so much of a, a struggle over land rights for women, and all that was happening. And we were doing this women farmers uh, uh, empowerment program, which became the Mahila Kisan Sashaktikaran Pariyojana, which was taken up by the government of India. We, we had called it MKSP, and there was this instance where we were giving this training for women, and then land, the land, all agriculture intervention happens on land, and whose name is land in? It's in the name of the husband or in the name of the mother-in-law or the father-in-law, they don't have. So then they ask, it's, where do we go and do this? You know, And there was an instance where this, uh, after being part of the training and all that, this woman was able to convince her husband and take one acre plot registered in her name. And she said, this is my plot for implementing all these interventions. Here again, it was it is not like some changes which happened overnight. The community observes us, they see, they look what we are doing, they come and participate. And, and another strategy we adopt in creating this gender transformation is not by keeping men away. Uh, so it is by including men in the uh, uh, participation, which doesn't, which means to say not as direct uh, participants in the program, uh, but as observers, you can come and be part of the meeting. You can listen to what we are talking because they are always afraid that we will we are doing activism in that space and we are creating trouble in the household. So we say you are most welcome to come and participate in the meeting. You listen to what we are talking. We are talking about agriculture. We are talking about pest management. Be part of it. You listen to this. If you really are convinced about what we are talking, you allow this women to do it in your field. We train them. They are equipped to do it. So they come with the scientific know-how. Uh, so that imparting of the scientific know-how and the technology and the skill 
we direct it to the women so that they have much more uh, that is their bargaining power na so when i come with skills when i come with knowledge then i have bargaining position with you but especially in a nature based livelihoods where this is important and uh, women are kept away from this okay okay ma'am okay uh, ma'am uh, is there any uh, reason or any uh, pivotal point in your life that uh, led you to this journey or that you took this up the sustainability or eco entrepreneurship or empowering women like is there something Yeah, I will have to disappoint you. I don't have a eureka moment kind of an <laughs> kind of. A, it's a very organic uh, shift that has happened. Uh, it's part of my work. So in a, in my earlier phases of my work, I was largely uh, looking at deprivation. You know, I was studying deprivation across rural urban regions of India, and then uh, we found that there is a. Uh, we were doing the studies across uh, districts of India, and we found that especially in rural as well as in urban. There's a strong linkage between deprivation or areas which are deprived and women's livelihood opportunities, right? So wherever women had uh, equal opportunities for livelihood engagement or labor force participation, we found that the deprivation was relatively less. So we found that this, there is this direct linkage between deprivation and women's livelihood opportunities, or women's education and other indicators. That's what got us into thinking of livelihood interventions. focused on women and inclusive of women slowly also leading to gender transformative changes why i keep referring to gender transformative is you can do you know there is a lot of programs designed around women which needn't necessarily be transformative in that sense yeah. the moment i say transformative we are trying to change gender relations and trying to change gender roles like i said na paravet is a gender role change uh mm -hmm. other things are gender role changes uh one second huh? so uh, so these are uh, we are looking at transformative changes we also have you know programs which are gender accommodative you know where women are participate but gender transformation is not an objective we also have gender inclusive where women are given participation again it's not aimed at transformation uh, you know women are enlisted as beneficiaries there and not necessarily Uh, uh, uh they you would not have competence or you know the your ultimate impact evaluation would not anchor on whether they have uh gender transformative changes okay, okay. but uh, in our interventions we consciously build gender transformation as one of those uh, major driving framework though it is not a stated direct upfront you don't have anything in a from an uh, activist point of intervention everything is through livelihoods through introduction of technologies through introduction of uh, uh, giving access to knowledge skill building and building this institutions or creating a social capital so this is our pathways uh, you know and providing the end to end support yes so it's more like a entire revolution forever like long term long term -ish. long term -ish, slow moving uh, maybe but uh, inclusive of the community we are not saying like nobody felt feels threatened in that sense we don't we don't create an atmosphere of threat you know okay. coming and working with my our women you are threatening our social uh, you know uh, status quo you are making this women uh, uh, you know they are challenging us now they don't not like that but it's a very constructive kind of change which okay. comes with a sense of understanding that's why we say we spend a lot of time sensitizing so you you see you feel that it is a something you know a, a small job no sensitization is requires a lot of patience and effort and consistent uh, effort so to say Okay. So, ma'am, as you're telling that you were uh, like conducting studies around the district states and all, so like you know the importance of universities and research institutions in the society. So, how can the research institution or universities can best support young entrepreneurs or yeah, budding researchers yeah, in yeah, yeah. sustainable agriculture or eco entrepreneurship? Correct. So, I, I was part of a uh, fantastic university. I was uh, part of a Kerala Agriculture University. Then I moved on to Tamil Nadu Agriculture University. But if I had continued my education uh, in the same pathway and continued in an academic space, I don't know if I would have had uh, the kind of orientation that I have now. You know, uh, instead of working with a foundation like M S Swami Nath Research Foundation, if I had worked with a university, I don't know how much of an orientation to uh, a, a social entrepreneurship building. or you know gender sensitization or bringing a gender transformative lens 
to agriculture intervention. I'm not sure how much I would have imbibed all of that. It was all part of the work, hands-on from the work that we kind of reorient ourselves and look at the field and see like, you oh know, whatever we do, unless there is a gender transformative lens to it, we will be keeping away 70% of the labor force who are actively dependent on agriculture from accessing anything that we are doing in the space. And everything will remain within, uh, you know, the East, the men and the community. Not that, you know, it's, it's not a, it's a uh, you know, uh, but uh, the point I'm trying to make is when women are legitimately contributing large amount of their labor and uh, they are contributing for their livelihoods as unpaid family labor, why shouldn't they get recognized for that? Why shouldn't they get the due rights? And why should they always be kept away from extension, kept away from science and technology interventions, kept away from uh, uh, institutional access to credit? So uh, because everything in agriculture or uh, uh, livelihoods which are linked to natural resources uh, are, are land-based and uh, hence land becomes a collateral. So if you do not have land rights, you are naturally kept away from accessing many of the entitlements. Mm -hmm. So working with women, we felt was important. And my training in the agriculture, now it has changed a lot. But when I was studying like 20, 25 years back, uh, we didn't bring this lens. So, you know, this uh, was, we were focused on technological interventions. It was very technocratic. Uh, mm -hmm. And institutional aspects was limited to extension, uh, agriculture extension. But not so much in terms of, you know, working with gender, working with caste, working with, uh, you know, social norms and things like that. Uh, so this is an understanding which I got after working with NSRF. But you you, you all are in a much more, uh, you know, uh, better place, you know, because there is across universities, especially with the adoption of sustainable development goals, across universities, there is a re-engineering of curriculum which is designed to address or equip this uh, young workforce, you know, equip this young graduates with enough skill sets to engage with many of these SDG goals, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, gender equality is one of those important SDG goals and uh, fighting zero hunger is another of the SDG goals. And many of you, you know, even if your university is thinking of having a shamsodhan or whatever you call like this, bringing people from practice and talking to you, that's a visible change that is happening in the ecosystem, right? At, at least in the academic ecosystem. So the young graduates are in a much better position to reorient yourself and think of the kind of skill sets that is required for addressing the challenges of our, uh, you know, of our community, be it the rural or the urban poor. You know, look for the vulnerable community, the challenges that they are facing and try to bring in those kind of solutions, sir. Uh, can you think of, you know, when you're thinking of social enterprises, think of those kind of enterprises which will make a meaningful change in the lives of uh, the poor and the deprived. So you are in a better position now because you have the orientation, you have the academic orientation, you also have opportunities to build your skill sets in such, some, such a way. So even learning psychology, I would encourage because, you know, many of the changes that you want to see is you, you have to know behavior. A behavioral change. These are all behavioral change that you are trying to invent, uh, intervene and create. So behavioral economics, behavioral sciences, all, all this learning, all this becomes important part of your entrepreneurship journey. In addition to knowing to knowing to keep your books, right? If you have to learn to keep your books, of course, that is the that is the technical part of it. But then a lot of soft skills is required in terms of mobilization, communication, sensitization. And a lot of patience, and it's it's almost like being the front end officer of a client facing uh, organization. Sir. But you will be, uh, you know, it's not just like you know, uh, it's much more than that. You know, you will be doing substantive changes there, but with the same kind of patience, demure, and kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, like a front end, a front office uh, staff. You, know, you need to have that patience, but with all the knowledge and wherewithal and the technical skills. So it is, you are playing all the roles at the same time. So being technically sound doesn't matter when you're going and speaking to very vulnerable people, you know, uh, who are thinking about their day-to-day -day existence, all your uh, paraphernalia doesn't matter. All that is matters is can you come down to their level and inspire them to get into something which you think will be useful for them, right? 
uh, based on your understanding. So, yeah, universities are, are redesigning themselves. For example, I'll tell you in our university, in Azim Premji University, we have a social enterprise set uh, wherein we, uh, you know, encourage students to participate and uh, we, we conduct an idea challenge, which is uh, we, we invite the... Uh, I think you should attend or you have attended. I'm not sure if Christ uh, has attended before. Universities, uh, uh, students from universities across India come and participate in it. They come up with their idea for a social enterprise. And this is there is a panel which is judging them. And there is a small prize money to God. And then there is you know, support for uh, incubation and uh, uh, you know, startups. So participating or creating platforms like Idea, idea Challenge or social entrepreneurship platforms could be one way that universities could think about this. Then we have also something because I, I, I work in the School of Development. Uh, I'm part of the School of Development. Uh, I'm, I'm, I coordinate something called Practitioner in Residence uh, for the program, uh, which is essentially bringing experienced practitioners who have been working in the social sector for 40 years, 50 years. Uh, so in the next week, uh, uh, Dr. Abhijit Das, who is part of the Center for Health and Social Justice, he's going to be with us for one week. What he, what essentially the program does is have this practitioner in residence, you know, for five days and engage with students in the program uh, in, in different electives and core courses, interact with the faculty, talk to them about what they do, how they do it and strategy, how they strategize and all that. As a very useful interaction or space for idea exchanges. And then there are a lot of students who get inspired by it. Similarly, when you're thinking about social enterprises or building those entrepreneurial skills among students, you can have something sim on similar lines. You could have an entrepreneur in residence, you know, somebody who's, you know, started a startup and then established it well and running it well. You could bring somebody like that and be in the campus as an entrepreneur for one week, have classes with you, have conversations with you. Let him, let him or her talk about how they started from the scratch and build this. That is a very key learning platform. And there is also like internship possibilities which can, you can think of and try and link with, uh, you know, institutions and be interning there or students in residence kind of internship for 20 weeks. And I've seen like several universities across the globe, uh, mostly European and US universities and also universities in India now have started creating these incubation centers where they support students to think about ideas, incubate it and support them with finances. And also mentoring, advising, and uh, uh, playing that mentoring role, uh, providing that mentoring service, and help them bloom as entrepreneurs and help them establish businesses. So there are these are different ways in which universities are rethinking, reshaping themselves, and uh, you know which each university which is thinking of uh, uh, creating this uh, cadre of entrepreneurs can think of uh, creating these spaces within their universities or creating these opportunities. And I think you should be part of uh, the, the students who are interested to be entrepreneurs should be part of this nationwide networks, which is floated by several uh, universities. Be members of that. You will get alerts on where the next uh, uh, competition is going to happen. Go and bid for a competition. You have seen the Shark Tank. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, but, but Shark Tank is okay. Like it is, um, I don't know how much of social enterprise part comes mm -hmm. into it. But there's a lot of these challenge competition, like the one that we are floating, the idea challenge is on social enterprises, not just entre uh, 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 entrepreneurship for profit alone. It's We need to have a social value into it. So that's an emphasis for the idea. So you can make use of these platforms. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, uh, Ma'am, uh, as a concluding question, but because we were talking about students and how we can get into uh, eco-entrepreneurship. Ma'am, uh, what are the career prospects are? What are the trends or opportunities for future in terms of Maybe intersection of eco entrepreneurship, sustainability, yeah. sustainable agriculture. What's the future? Yeah, yeah. So because we are in a very um, uh, that's what I'm saying. Like you no, know, this generation or the the, the young generation now uh, is in a, a very nice space. You know, you have the ecosystem, uh, you have the uh, the larger buy-in for all this kind of you know green growth. Green growth is being spoken about. Uh, uh, we are also as a nation or globally also committed for uh, just transition pathways in development, wherein we are talking about zero energy, uh, you know, uh, net zero emissions. Uh, so there's a lot of scope for these kind of technologies or entrepreneurship, which talks about environmental conservation or based on eco-based uh, services or ecosystem service harnessing. 
and uh, technologically also you know we are in a very prime place you know we are talking about ai not ai and its uh, you know detrimental uses but ai and its constructive uses no you have internet of things which is being used extensively for uh, <coughs> a lot of uh, uh, efficient for, uh, you know uh, in different industries across sectors uh, iot is becoming applied even in agriculture you know, artificial intelligence is being extensively used in agriculture in precision farming and all those so there is no dearth of opportunities uh, neither in the institutional space nor in terms of an ecosystem for entrepreneurship budding and uh, you know sustaining your entrepreneurship nor in terms of technological know hows or technological advancements nor in terms of capabilities uh, you know or uh, uh, spaces for building your capabilities opportunities for building your capabilities so uh, you have to create the correct ecosystem you know if the university spaces can be the starting point for that by creating the correct ecosystem and then latch on to other larger networks that would be a, a good transition pathways and i think you should, it, it is uh, uh, you know rather than being scared of artificial intelligence taking away people's job i think we should engage with artificial intelligence and see how can it be constructively used to help humanity just like how biotechnology biotechnology so, uh, people speak about it ill effects also but there are also constructive uses of biotechnology without biotechnology we wouldn't have seen the kind of uh, uh, you know um, the food security that we see today so there are certain things that biotechnology only could address uh, so let's look at the constructive ways in which technologies can be used and harnessed for the well being of uh, humans and without without uh, you know being detrimental to the environment you know being conserving of the environment and pulling people out of poverty okay. so some of these areas yeah yeah uh um, ma'am uh, as much as it's like uh, when initially i got your profile i was a bit skeptical like will i be able to understand or interact with you in the right way but then you literally spoke it like it was more like listening to a story of beautiful journey it was very understandable thanks a lot for that personally ma'am thank you thank you thank you and i would stop with uh, saying something like you you are thinking of your you are in a very prestigious university uh, with a faculty uh, eminent faculty is guiding you and doing all this and you, you know it's a it's a easy transition for you if you want to to get into anything i'm not just just saying about entrepreneurship any kind of profession i'll tell you an interview because one of the questions that you asked early i'll tell you a small story about um, a, a group of uh, illiterate landless agricultural laborers who are running the state of the art bio input centers uh in one of those districts in tamil nadu with complete with the autoclaves lamina flows the liquid bio fertilizer units and that bottling and it's 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 fantastic so they were trained on doing this uh, you know culturing of uh, bio inoculums uh, producing this bio inputs the bio fertilizers and bio pesticides uh, and managing this they started off with you know their traditional pressure cookers in the place of autoclaves now they have this huge autoclave i don't know if you know if you seen the autoclaves which is used for sterilizing large you will see it in your labs if you go to your biology or biotechnology labs you will see this lamina flows where they do this culturing so whole of this thing is in a small village in uh, dindigal and it is run and managed by illiterate women literally illiterate women you know who were uh, landless agriculture they don't have land there. so they were engaging in it so uh, you know if they could learn this state of the art way of making bio inputs and now they are outsourcing they are selling this tons and tons of this bio inputs to big companies the big companies then you know sell it in their label saying that this is produced by this women and they get orders from across india like gujarat rajasthan all this places and they transport tons of materials uh, which is a requirement for the green growth pathway you know we are talking about shifting people out of uh, uh, you know chemical intensive agriculture but where is the input so somebody has to produce it decentralized and uh, so look at this women like you know five six of them Uh, who has not had any exposure to any formal school education doing this wonderful uh, you know social enterprise uh, that's a, that's that's a true example of a social enterprise right and another area i would tell you is like whenever we are shi- shifting to nature based uh, anything like nature based we have seen that even in our, in the example that i showed you it's good for the women because they have an additional income but nevertheless it doesn't take away the time and energy and the labor that they are spending it's only increasing it 
now you have an opportunity there can you think of uh, interventions or on entrepreneurship or enterprises which can focus on reducing the drudgery of the women right so that they can better engage in the productive space right so these are some of those ideas that you can work on which are the need of our instead of you know running behind the same uh, kind of uh, ideas look at things small you might think it is very small but it it's 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 a game changer for those people who do not have access to it for us we are so used to this comforts of life we don't realize the importance of it but making it low cost accessible easily available for those kind of communities it's really a game changer you will really be satisfied with what you do still on a profit yeah. right it's so, more like an eye opener that there's not out yeah. there to do <laughs> i think ha huh, i think we should you have the ecosystem you have the technical know how you have all the support system but you have to have your feet firmly on the ground okay and look little in words like okay america is very welcoming uh, europe is very attractive but look a little in words and see like what's happening uh, to our countrymen what can we do about it you know uh, i'm not saying like you shouldn't go out and of course you should do that but can we do something for our own community right yeah. okay so thank you so much ma'am and as this interview comes to an end uh, i want to express my heartfelt appreciation for enlightening session we've had with you i am sure uh, your passion for sustainable development and insightful perspective has left a lasting impact on all of us ma'am your dedication to ecological sustainability gender empowerment and sustainable agriculture has been truly inspiring thank you thank, thank you, you very much and look forward to seeing some of you at the yeah. idea challenge next time i'll yeah. i'll remember to send an invite to your professor rishikesh yeah. and, and we'll we'll definitely be there yeah. Yeah. Thank you. thanks a lot ma'am thank, thank you thank you so much thank you ma'am Thank you. I'll sign off. Huh?